When you hear that opening to the 1980 Dolly Parton hit, you naturally start preparing yourself for what's coming next. A worker's anthem. Working nine to five, what a way to make a living, really getting by, it's all taking and no giving. That may seem like a weird characterization of an Academy Award nominated song by a woman who's been dubbed the Queen of Country, a national treasure, who's been nominated for 47 Grammys, won over 150 awards, has composed over 3,000 songs, a Broadway musical, and she's released 64 studio albums. And a woman who has said for years that she modeled her look after the so-called town tramp. The people that they call trash in my hometown here in Sevier County, the loose women, well, that was the women that I thought were, were beautiful. So I've been at it all my life, trying to be gaudy. But when you start to break 9 to 5 down lyric by lyric, by the end you're almost expecting Parton to call for the overthrowing of the bourgeois in her sweet Appalachian tones. It's such a perfect embodiment of the radical labor movements that were taking place in the United States throughout the 1960s and 70s. But the song is also an unintentional melody of the sort of radical politic that Dolly Parton herself represents in her life and work. Dolly Parton is an American icon. Her look, her sound, her whole damn existence. Now that I've made it, no matter how hard it gets, I mean, I'm not about to bitch about it now. She was born in a small town in Tennessee in a small log cabin, one of 12 kids. We had a roof over our head, I always say, even if it did leak. We had something to eat on our table, even if it wasn't exactly what we wanted. Had a bed to sleep in, even if there's a bunch of us in it. She started singing at the age of 10, but her career really launched in 1967 when she became a regular on the Porter Wagner Show. Right now I want to call out a little gal here that her and I have had a lot of luck with a couple of single records. I haven't called you out yet. Wait just a minute there, kiddo. Within a few years, she became the queen of country with hits like He said you just called me Josh. Jolene, Jolene. more than to just be a farmer's daughter, even though I'm proud to be. Uh, I just wanted uh, pretty things. I wanted money to buy the things that I had always been impressed with as a child. But at the foundation of what makes her iconic is how Parton stands as both a rebuke and embrace of the expectation of a woman from the poverty-stricken foothills of Appalachia. We were very proud people people with a lot of class. It was country class, but it was a great deal of class. And uh, most of um, my people were not that educated, but they are very, very intelligent. Good common sense, horse sense, we called it. And while Parton herself stays away from talking politics, her own life has been a testament to how she has stood with people. I don't care what if, whether, whether it's your race, or whether you're green, blue, black, red, or alien gray, or whether you're male or female, or transgender. If you do work, you should be paid and appreciated for it, and you should be respected and appreciated for who and what you are. She makes people feel good about who they are, whether they're an evangelical Christian or a gay drag queen, or both of those things combined, right? Dolly represents, she's their avatar. She's somebody who can be someone's icon. And to fully understand Parton as that kind of radical, every person icon, we have to look at 9 to 5, the film, the song, and the album. 9 to 5 was a title song for an office revenge comedy with the same name, and it starred Jane Fonda, Lily Tomlin, Dolly Parton. The premise of the film is pretty straightforward. These three women work for this guy. He's rude, lies, gives opportunities earned by women to less deserving men, and he genuinely seems to believe that sexual harassment is as necessary as his morning coffee. Mr. Hart, I've told you before, I'm a married woman. And I'm a married man. That's what makes it so perfect. Oh, Mr. Hart. No, Dorothy, ah! please. Look, I want you. Oh, for I heaven's need you. sake. What are you doing, Mr. Hart? Call me Frank. One day during a particularly inspired weed smoking sesh, these three women relish in fantasies about how they'd like to exact revenge. And a series of events lead them to eventually kidnapping him. While they've held him hostage, the women take over the office and start enacting a series of reforms, like equal pay between men and women, better work hours, even an in-house daycare for parent employees. 
The movie ends with a happy ending for the ladies and the boss gets what he deserves, abducted by the indigenous of the Amazon. Because why not? Now, again, on a superficial level, the movie comes across as your run-of-the-mill cute office comedy, but it was released in 1980, a year that ended the decade of one of the most militant and successful eras for labor and women's rights. Throughout the late 60s and 70s, the United States experienced a labor upheaval. Hard-earned union rights were being rolled back, and workers across industries pushed right back. From postal employees to California Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers to the coal miners of Harlan County, Kentucky, workers were shutting down their industries to demand rights and protect their unions. And right alongside, if not within these movements, there were civil rights and women's rights groups also pushing for economic and protective equality in the workplace. Think, for example, the 1980 clarification that under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, that sexual harassment was in fact totally illegal. So it's in that context that the film 9 to 5 comes out. It mixes two of the largest movements of the previous 20 years and uses comedy to make a radical point about workers' rights and sexual harassment in a way that's palatable and not preachy. I mean, think of it this way. Three female workers feeling detached from their labor and suffering abuse from their boss overthrow him and introduce reforms that benefit both men and women equally. The film may as well be called Full Communism Now. Now, that's the film. What about part and song? In the same way the film 9 to 5 is a worker's homage to her sweat and toil, as well as her revolt, the song 9 to 5 is her lament, but also her hope. This chorus, catchy and relatable, actually does a pretty good job of summing up philosopher Karl Marx's theory of worker alienation, which is a huge part of his overall critique of capitalism and not something you'd expect from a catchy pop country song. According to Marx, because workers don't control the work that they do in any real sense, their lives lose a sense of purpose because they become, in that process, commodities themselves. They're just a means to an end, the end being profit for the boss. In the song 9 to 5, Parton makes this alienation pretty clear with lyrics like yawn and stretch and try to come to life. They use your mind, but they never give you credit. Barely getting by, it's all taken and no given. You're just a step on the boss man's ladder. But when you take that song and hold it next to the film 9 to 5, the song becomes a radical critique. But there's more. Parton released a song on her 24th studio album entitled 9 to 5 and Odd Jobs. This album, filled with original songs and covers, captures Parton's working class sympathies and experiences, sometimes in a surprising way. It takes a hard look at the class struggle in America. Songs like Deportee, songs about coal miners, um, songs about being poor in a small town, songs about rural poverty. Take, for example, Poor Folks Town, an original song on the album. So come on down, have a look around. Rich folks living in a poor folks town. And another original, Sing for the Common Man. Then there's Deporti. It's a cover of proud communist Woody Guthrie's protest song about a group of Mexican workers who were killed in a plane crash over Los Gatos, California in 1948. And in media coverage, they were simply referred to as deportees. Goodbye to my one goodbye, Rosalita. Adios, mis amigos, Jesus and Maria. You are. Each song in the album illustrates a different aspect of working class America, and together they create perhaps Dolly Parton's most provocative, definitely most radical, homage to the everyday person. 
she's someone who understands what it's like to be hungry, to be without electricity, to be lacking in basic needs and resources. Um, I think it gives her songwriting, and for that matter her philanthropy, a great sense of empathy. But Parn has notoriously stayed away from getting political. She's actually got a pretty good swerve. Where do you stand on this election? Right now, I just, I just don't know. I, it's just the greatest show on television right now. That, however, hasn't stopped her from pushing policies in her own way. Take, for example, two of her biggest philanthropic efforts, the Imagination Library and the My People Fund. The Imagination Library is a charitable effort that Dolly started originally in her home county that gives books to young children uh, to encourage them to read. It's since expanded into several countries across many states um, and become one of the largest children's literacy programs in the world. To date, the Imagination Library has given out 100 million free books to kids all over the United States. The My People Fund provided $1,000 a month for six months with a final check of $5,000 to 1,300 families who had lost everything in the 2016 Tennessee wildfires. I know it's been a trying time for my people and this assistance will help. She gave this money to the residents of her hometown with no strings attached, didn't tell them how to spend it, understanding that they would have the agency and, and the knowledge to do what they needed to recover. In the end, the Dolly Foundation would give over $8 million to impacted families. Nobody but you would be so kind oh, and generous. I'm sure nearly anybody up here would do that. These are good people. No. And that's what Dolly Parton as a radical icon comes down to. Someone who believes that people are fundamentally good and that they deserve good. All right, how many of you guys actually thought you'd spend some time watching a video about how Dolly Parton is a Marxist icon? You're welcome. Let us know what you guys thought. Also, let us know what else you want us to cover in future episodes of Pop Americana, and we'll see you next week.